that was covering it up. Return the meeting. There we go. Okay. Now, I'm going to share the screen. And we'll share this screen right here. All right. That was my problem. My Screencast-O-Matic was covering what I needed to do. Okay, here we go. All right. So let's go from current slide. All right. Thomas, you're still there, right? Yes. Okay. Anyone else join the class since Thomas? Okay, hopefully some more will be coming in. I hope no one came early and couldn't catch me because I, my last class ran over. Uh, they had a bunch of questions at the end, and I could not get them offline until this class was already to start. And I had to run to the restroom and come back, and so there was dead time there. And then various things happened technically, but we're where we need to be now, except I don't have enough students in the room. So hopefully they will be coming. Uh, now, I'm a bit concerned because since we started doing this, Thomas is the only one that's made it to class, okay? And I don't know where everybody else is. Um, and I can't talk to you because, well, I will. In case you're listening to it on, on uh, the YouTube videos, uh, let me say this. The how you... The invite to Zoom is located in Blackboard under Messages. So go to Blackboard, this class in Blackboard, go to Messages, and click on your message. You'll see the invite for the class that's coming up, the one that's now. Of course, this isn't doing anything for people now because this won't be out there until sometime later tonight or tomorrow morning. So, uh, but for next time, please go there and then... Thomas, tell me how you do it. Do you uh, take the HTTP line that's on the invite, put it in your, uh, at the top of your, uh, uh, whatever provider you're using, and just go to that, or do you type in codes and stuff? So, for mine, I already have the website for Zoom pulled up. Uh-huh. Right, okay. You can do it that way, or you can do the HTTP line that's there. And if you look at that closely, you'll see that code and or the password, I think, are already embedded in that line. And you can just copy that into the line at the top. You know, I can't think what you call it, command line or whatever. And, and then it'll take you right there. But the way you're doing it is perfectly fine. And, uh, but you, you are going to the messages to get that information, right? Yeah, that's where I went to. Right. Okay. Uh, and evidently, you're the only one who is doing that. I don't know what the others are doing. So if you are listening, then for Thursday's class, go on Wednesday night or sometime Wednesday. I will put it out there, uh, the invite, and get the information there and then be in class on Thursday. And See, I originally thought it was in announcements. Yes. When I first started doing this, I did it in announcements. But then I saw that um, that little icon up there, and I thought that was just a shortcut to the announcements. So I started doing it through there. And I'm sort of glad I did because I found students had been sending me messages there. So I thought, well, this is the best way to do the announcements. Then I found out just yesterday, that's not announcements. Those are two different issues. So sorry about that. But yeah, we are going to go through the messages from now on because... I thought that's probably where students would look. I don't know. Tell me, how does it look different from you, the message and the announcement? Does the announcement pop up automatically, or does the, and you have to go to the message? What's the difference? See, I don't see the students in. So sometimes it's when I, like, log into Blackboard, the announcement will pop up on my screen, and then, like, I can choose to dismiss it or look at the next announcement. Okay. Okay, well, have you been getting emails from me when you get I this? I got an email 18 hours ago when you sent out the Okay, thing, okay. So All right. Some people may just not be checking. Okay, which is better in your mind, the announcement or the message? Um, well, I personally thought the announcement was better at first, but after like, looking at my email, I think that because it emails you and sends you the message on Blackboard, that I think that probably works a little better. 
Okay. Okay, I think I can probably do both. Do you think that would be better? Yeah, I think that would work because then people, like if they look in one place and then look in the other, they'll still find it regardless. Right. Okay, I'll probably start trying to do that. But the trouble is I've done it both ways and still you're the only one that's shown up. So yeah. I, I, I don't know what to do about the others. Hopefully they, maybe someone will hear this. Do you have any way of getting in touch with any of the other members of the class? Do I do not. You so didn't share. Any information. Yeah. Okay. So I was going to say if you did, if you could spread the word that way, uh, like a phone tree or something. But all right. Well, I, I guess it's just you and me again. You and me and the dog named Blue or something like me and you and a dog named Blue or something. All right. So if my memory's right, we finished section 5.2 last time and we're just getting ready to start 5.3, right? Okay, so chapter five is still analytic tri trigonometry. Um, 5.3 is solving trigonometric equations. Now on my screen, you and me are blocking that, so I'm going to move up to the corner. I don't know if you see this or not. But solving trigonometric equations, 5.3. All right, now I'm still blocking something here. But anyway, the objectives here are to use the standard algebraic techniques to solve trigonometric equations. We'll solve trigonometric equations of the quadratic type. We'll solve trigonometric equations involving multiple angles. And we'll solve, use inverse trigonometric functions to solve trigonometric equations. And that leads to the introduction. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Or any questions at all? Oh, let me go on and say this, because this is pretty important, I think. Um, I guess you've heard by now that we're not going back to campus this spring. Had you? Yeah, I heard about that. Right. And uh, I'd been saying that all along. There was no way we we're going back, go back because my wife's an infectious disease epidemiologist. She's been studying the numbers from, uh, goodness, who's that uh, famous clinic uh, up in, in Baltimore. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, it has a hyphenated name, uh, but I, it escapes me. But anyway, she's been following their numbers, and she says that April's going to be the worst month we've had, and it's just going to continue to get worse for a while, and maybe after a while it might start getting a little better, but I knew there was no way we were going back to, to campus or Another way of phrasing it, that I was going to be able to go back to campus because of my health condition. But anyway, we're not. Now, I don't know if you heard this. This is a little more recent. Summer is going to be just like this. We're not going to campus for summer. We're going to have this kind of class. They're going to start using this phraseology. These are virtual classes. Just like a classroom, meeting at the same time as a class, everything's the same. We're just doing it on our computers. These are what they're going to call virtual classes. Now, they still will have a few online classes. Not that many, but those are the distance ed classes that, you know, you, they, they put assignments all out on Blackboard. You log in anytime you want, do you do the assignments. There will be some of those classes. Uh, trig, of course, won't be done that way. Calculus won't be done that way. Uh, but a few classes are done that way. But that's what's always done. Most of our classes are going to be just like this, uh, virtual classes, just the same as we were in the classroom. So that's the big news that has come up over the weekend. Number one, that we weren't coming, going back to, to campus this spring, but now we're not going back in the summer either, but we're still going to run classes this summer, but they're all going to be either virtual or online. Okay? Were you planning to come this summer? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. Okay. Are you graduating? Yes. Okay. I was going to graduate. And then well, graduation. okay. You are going to graduate whether there's a ceremony or not. Right. But, um, I figured that. yeah. Uh, one of my other students in the last class said that they had asked for opinions on it or whatever and uh, that she had voted for. And I just noticed my. Power is 
fluctuating some here. Let me fiddle with my plug a minute. This is so irritating. Okay, I think it's more stable now. Okay. Um, and she had voted for July or August and was afraid that might not happen. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. We're going to have to see how the numbers go. If you, if you do care to go to some of those places that do show trends in other countries, we are just lagging the other countries because we didn't get the exposure they did er as early as they did. But if you look at the other countries, you'll see they went way high, they peaked, and then slowly started coming down. We're still on the peaking part. We're still on our way up. And you can look at the other countries and see how rapidly or slowly they move down. We're probably going to follow a pattern a lot like them. That's going to put us, at least her best guess is, that toward the end of summer, the, it looks like the cases will be going down. Whether it's going to be enough for us to have a ceremony at the end of summer, we're not sure. Okay, if we can't, then it'll be lobbed in with the uh, one at the end of fall term. But uh, it will you will graduate whenever you're scheduled to graduate. It's just that we won't have a ceremony until we can have one, and then only if you choose to go. So that's the answer to that. Do you have any other questions, concerns, or anything like that? Okay, say that one more time. You faded at the end. Yeah, yeah, I've been having a little bit of trouble with my mic. Oh, I see. And so that's probably why I faded it out and why it cut me off. Okay. And that's also why you're not going to be able to answer some questions, I bet, too, right? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, thought so. It caused mm -hmm. problems for the other professors, too. What's that again? It caused problems for other professors, too. Oh, I see. So. Has mine been fairly stable? Right. So that's every, every now and then I get a little message on the screen. I haven't today yet, but it'll say Intersect Signal Week or something like that. So I may have some of that too. So, All right. Any other questions or issues? I don't think so. All right. Well, let's go on with the introduction then. Uh, to solve a trigonometric equation, we do it just about like we'd solve any kind of equation. Okay. You use your standard techniques that you have. Collect like terms, factor, do whatever you can, and you're trying to isolate the variable. With trigonometric equations, you've got another issue here. We have a trig function in there. So usually you have to tr solve first for the trig function and then for the variable. So that the preliminary goal, that's what the second paragraph is saying, your preliminary goal in solving trigonometric equation is to isolate the trigonometric function on one side of the equation. Okay? Now that may be somewhat challenging because sometimes you may have two or more trig functions. Well, you do whatever it takes to get down to one trig function, then isolate it. Now, if that trig function is in a quadratic sense, that's when the factoring will come into play. Okay? But you always try to get it to a single trig function, get it on one side of the equation. If it's linear, you get all your trig functions on one side and all the numbers on the other side, like at the bottom, sine x equal one half. Yeah, we can handle that, okay? But if that was sine squared x, then we want everything on one side with a zero on the other side, just like you did with regular equations. So isolate the trig function. For example, if you started with this, 2 sine x equal 1, we want to isolate the trig function, the sine. So divide both sides by 2, and that gives you sine x is equal to 1 half. Hey, oh, look at that. Popped right up. The sine x equal 1 half, we can do that. We know what, okay, remember, your x here is an angle, right? Now, that angle may be in degrees, or it may be in radians, but it's an angle. You take a trig function of angles. Okay, the book doesn't focus on it that way. That's what I like to call it. Okay, and what angle would give you a sine of one half? Do you remember one of our favorite ones? Which angle? 
Yeah, what angle we give you when you take the sine of the angle, you get one half. Okay, it's either going to be in degrees or radians. In degrees, which I usually think of in terms of degrees first, that would be x equal, <laughs> gave it away, well, all right, x equal 30 degrees, okay? Or in radians, that would be pi 6 radians. Actually, I'm so used to radians now, I really did think of pi 6 first, but I thought you probably thought in degrees first. Now, I don't know if you remember this little trick. Uh, I'm going to draw a circle. We can call it a unit circle if you want to. That's not very circular, and it's not really very square. But remember, you have pi 6 or 30 degrees. You have 45 degrees, you have 60 degrees, and you have 90 degrees, okay? And you have zero degrees. Now, here's how I remember the signs, okay, of those angles. That's 45, that's a pretty ugly 5, 45 degrees. It's the square root of 0 over 2, that's for 0 degrees, which, of course, is 0 is a zero there uh, and my pen is acting strange again so that's zero this is the square root of one over two which is one half that's why i knew it was 30 degrees 45 is the square root of two over two yeah we knew that one right and square root and 60 degrees is the square root of three over two the sign is and pi halves or 90 degrees is the square root of four over two which of course is Square root of 4 is 2, 2 over 2 is 1. So those, that to me is the easy way to remember the signs of our favorite degrees here. This is uh, pi 6, pi 4, pi thirds, and pi halves. And of course 0. Okay. Um, so as soon as you see one of those numbers, uh, 1 half or root 2 over 2, root 3 over 2, one, zero, those are ones we know, okay? The signs of those numbers. Now, the cosines just go in the opposite direction. You start up here, the cosine of 90 is zero, cosine of 60 is one half, cosine of 45 is root two over two, square root of 30 is square uh, root three over two, and the square root of zero, I mean, the cosine of zero is one. It, they just go backwards from what sign does. And then the... Tr the tangents are just the ratios of those. So those are pretty easy to write down any time that you, you need them. Remember that little thing. So anyway, so that's only one angle, though, that whose sine is one-half. Remember, uh, over here, the same angle on this side, 30 degrees short of 180, that would be 150 degrees, that also is going to have a sine of one, uh, a, a sine of one half, okay. And this, by the way, is uh, five six pi. My pen is so slow, and it doesn't write sometimes at all. Five six pi, okay. But then, if you keep going around the circle, when you get over here, and you get to seven six pi, there you're here again. And when you get to 11, 6, pi, you're over here. You just keep going round and round. And that's what the next slide should. And if you started going backwards, then this would be at minus uh, 7, 6, pi. You know, so any, no, yeah, minus 7, 6, pi. And that's what this next one is showing. Here is your sine function. Get to know that. That's important to know. Starts at zero, goes up to one at pi halves. You know, it looks like this. Pick the line y is equal to one half. They did a dotted line. I'm going to put it a little more solid. Everywhere it crosses, that's going to be a solution for that equation. Okay? So how can we express that? 
Well, one way is because sine is periodic with a period of 2 pi, right? So we can say it's the x is equal to pi 6, which we said before. They, they like to deal with the radians, and that's what most of the time they'll deal with. Plus 2n pi. So in other words, if n is 1, that would be 2n pi. That would be 7, 6 pi. If that n was a minus 1, that would be back here at um, this one here. Uh, pi 6 minus 2 pi, that would be minus 12 pi. That would be negative 11, 6 pi. Okay, so all those can be covered by that. Or the second place here was at 5, 6 pi which we showed before, and then that's also plus 2n pi. Of course, n can be any integer, positive or negative. So I think I'll do a different color here. What color would you like? Blue. Blue. Uh, Carolina blue or dark blue? Um, I guess do medium. Okay, we'll do this blue. Okay, this will be your 5, 6 pi, and the 2 n pi would be that one, and 2 n pi, whoops, I went too far, would be this one, okay? Okay, where your first one, let me get my pen back to its color, uh, that would be this one, this one, and that one, okay? So you have to list both of them, because these are not a constant uh, multiple of each other, but the others are. You know, the others are 2 pi added or subtracted or some multiple of 2 pi added or subtracted to the, the simple ones, pi 6 and 5, 6 pi. So that's how we express them. Now, if we're only going on the interval 0 to 2 pi, we would then do from here to, where's my 2 pi? pi, this is 2 pi. So we wouldn't include these out here or these over here. So then it would only be our pi, pi 6 and 5 pi 6. So you have to pay attention first. Do they express an interval? If they don't, then you have to put expressions like this. Okay? If they do express an interval, then you just go for that interval. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of? A little bit? Not at all? Okay. So, and this is what I was saying before. Moreover, because sine x has a period of 2 pi, there are infinitely many other solutions, and we express them as that first one, pi, five, pi 6 plus 2n pi, or 5, 6 pi plus 2n pi, where n is any integer, positive or negative integer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay? Or even 0. If n is 0, then you have the 5, 6, and 5, 5, 6. Okay. That's called your general solution. That includes everyone in all of creation, okay? Uh, the entire number line for all real number, uh, integers n. Make sense? I guess your microphone's not working. Okay. All right. Here's the figure below, which is another way to show this. Sine x equal one half has infinitely many solutions. Here is the one that was at pi six. This is what I was showing before. This is the one at five six pi, one six pi short of pi. Okay, and then every time you go around the circle in the counterclockwise, you do another two n pi, another two n pi, another two n pi, or this one another 2n pi, another 2n pi, another 2n pi, another 2 pi. Or, in a negative direction, negative 2n pi, negative 2 pi, negative 2, 3, 4 pi, negative 6 pi, negative 8 pi, 2n pi. Or this one, in the clockwise direction, would be minus 2 pi, minus 4 pi, minus 6 pi. So, whether you go right or left, that's whether the n is positive or negative. Okay.
Okay. So any angles that are coterminal with either pi 6 or 5 pi 6 will also be a solution for the equation. So in solving trigonometric equations, you should write your answers using exact values rather than decimal approximations. Now, I don't really care, but if you're following the answers in the book or going to calcchat.com or calcview.com, that's how they're going to express them. So if you put it down as a decimal number, and if you're reading it off your calculator, that's all it's going to give you is a decimal number. So you have to figure out whether you've got it right or not. So better idea. Use the exact answer, which is 5 pi 6 or pi 6 or whatever. Make sense? Still not there. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Okay. All right, that leads us to example 1. Okay. Whoa here. Here's an equation. It says solve the equation. Now, how would you suggest we go about solving the equation? Sine x plus root 2 is equal to minus sine x. We need to get sine x on the same side. Same side. So I would suggest adding sine x to both sides. Is that what you were thinking? Yes. Okay. This way these go to zero, which is good. Okay, now we can do this in two steps if you want to. This would be 2 sine x plus root 2 is equal to 0 now because we took everything off that side. What do you right. do next? Now we need to move the square root of 2 over to the other side. Exactly. Now that's because the sine is to the first power. If that was to the second power, then you don't do that. You, you're, you have it exactly like you want it, though that would be a nasty thing to deal with. But since this is to the first power, just like if you had 7x plus 4 is equal to 0, yeah, isolate the x. Now we're isolating the sine x, so you're absolutely right. Let's subtract root 2 from both sides. Okay, now we have 2 sine x and these add to zero is equal to negative root two. Okay, what's next? What is next? Okay, I don't know if you still there? Simplify it somehow, right? Yes. You want to isolate the sine x. Divide by, by both sides by 2. Perfect. Now those go away because 2 over 2 is 1. So now we have sine x is equal to minus root 2 over 2. Now, once you've isolated the sine x, you try to figure out what x is. Now, <clears throat> you can do this in several ways. Here's my suggestion. First, deal with the minus sign. Where in the world is a sine function negative? In which quadrant? Or quadrants? Okay. I'm not sure. I don't know if you remember this. All students take calculus. Well, maybe they don't, but I like that. Some say all students take chemistry. Others say all state technical college. Something to remember that by. This means all your functions are positive in the first quadrant. Okay? This means only sine and its reciprocal, which is cosecant. Sine and cosecant are positive in this quadrant. Only tangent and its reciprocal, which is cotangent, are positive in the third quadrant, and only cosine and its reciprocal, which is secant, are positive in the fourth quadrant. Okay. Okay. Now, so, again I ask, where is sine negative? And which one? The S quadrant. No, it's positive there. All are positive here. This means positive. Sine positive. 
tangent positive, cosine positive. So these are the positives one. Okay? So we're a sine negative. All are positive in the first, sine and cosecant are positive in the second, only the tangent and cosecant are positive in the third, and only the cosine and secant are positive in the fourth, so where is sine negative? Um, in the bottom two. Bottom two, the third and fourth. So that's where we're looking now. So, my next question to you is to figure out the angle. And forget about the sign for now. You know you're in the bottom two quadrants, the third and fourth quadrants. What is the angle that you take a sign of it and you get root 2 over 2? Remember the little diagram we did before? This only works for sign now. At pi 6, it was root 1 over 2. And pi fourth, it was root 2 over 2. So it's your pi fourths. But not in the first quadrant, that's positive. Not in the second quadrant, that would be positive. Your pi fourths in the third and the fourth quadrant. Okay? Now, what is this angle there? If this is pi fourths. Okay, pi force is 45 degrees. The 45 degrees is this one right up here. It's positive there. We don't want that one. We want down here where this is 45. Okay? But how far did you have to go to get here before you could do that last 45? Straight line is what angle? 180 plus 45 would be 225. 225. Perfect. Now, in, in uh, radians, what would that be? Well, how many radians does it take to get to the straight line? How far have you gone there? Other words, why, how many radians are equivalent to 180 degrees? Remember we did that in our conversions when we're going back and forth from degrees to radians. I don't remember that. Okay. Do you remember how one complete circle? How many radians would that be? In other words, what's the period of a sine or a cosine function? Oh, 2 pi. 2 pi. Okay. So what would halfway around that circle be? Uh, 1 pi. 1 pi. So if you add a quarter pi to a full pi... How many pi? Oh, that's making me hungry. Okay. How many quarter pies is one full pie? Four fourths. And then add one fourth to it and you get? Four and a half. Right? Four and one quarter. Or five quarters, right? Right. Yeah, that's how they usually express it. So x would be five pi over four. Okay. Now, they didn't put any restrictions on this, so that would also be, and this is a sine function, whose period is 2 pi, so you do plus 2n pi, where n is the integer, any energy you want to put. Now, that would take care of this angle. We still got this one over here. So how, <coughs> uh, I think what I'll do to 
make it a little clearer here as I'll erase some of this other junk here so you can see better. I can't, ah, oh, there we go. Now, I'll leave that and that's probably clear enough. Okay. Now, what would this angle over here be? Um, 360. Minus. You're 45 degrees short, 360, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. So, 360 minus 45, 315 degrees, right? Now, my 45 isn't quite a 45. It's a little short, but whatever. Okay, but usually the book's not going to use degrees. They're going to use radians. So how far short of you are of, of one circle? One circle is how many radians? Two pi. Two pi. So it'd be two pi minus, and your, what was this one again? Um, five pi. Oh, no, 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 that was pi fourths. This little angle here is just pi fourths, right? Pi fourths. Okay. The, the total over here was five pi over four. Okay. Oh, okay. So how many fourths is two pi's? Eight fourths minus one fourth would be seven fourths. Okay, or seven pi fourths plus two n pi. The two n pi is because it's a sine function whose period is two, two pi. Okay, so there are your answers. This is the five fourths pi plus two n pi, and there's the seven fourths pi plus two n pi. Now, you could have said it this way, too. You could have said this is minus pi fourths plus 2 m pi. That would have worked. And minus 3 quarters pi plus 2 m pi. They all give you the same answers. Because if you put an n of minus 1 here, this would be minus 2 pi, which is minus 8 fourths pi, plus uh, 5 fourths pi would be minus 3 fourths pi. And that's exactly what we said that was. And if you put a minus 1 here, that would have been your... 8 fourths pi minus, uh, minus 8 fourths pi plus 7 fourths pi is minus 5 fourths, which is exactly what you do. So it doesn't matter what your beginning node is there. They usually do the positive, the smallest positive angle. Not always, but they usually will do that. So let's see. That's how we did it. Let's see how they did it. All right, to erase it, you need it a little longer. You there? Might need. Um, yeah, um. You need it a little longer, or need, can I erase? Well, oh, it erased on its own. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Forget that. Okay, I don't know why. I was just holding my finger there, waiting for you to say something, and evidently that was close enough, a quarter inch away. I don't know. So anyway, how do they do? Begin by isolating x sine x on one side of the equation, just like you said, by adding sine x on both sides. That, that's what they've done here. That gave you a zero here and two sine x over here. They subtracted the root two from both sides. They still have added the sine x's together, but I guess at some point they will. Oh, there they did. Two sine x is equal to minus root two. And then just like you did, divide by two, and you get sine x is equal to minus root two over two. So there you've isolated, you solve for the sine x. So now you have to figure out what x will give you that value when you take the sine of it. Okay, because sine has a period of 2 pi, first find all the solutions in that first interval 0 to 2 pi. Okay, and we knew it wasn't between 0 and pi because sine is always positive there. So it's somewhere after uh, pi and our reference angle in this case that's what we used to call it is pi fourths so those solutions are five pi fourths that's one fourth pi past pi or seven fourths pi which is one fourth pi short of two pi 
And then finally, you add the multiples of 2 pi to each of those two solutions. That gave us our 5 fourths pi plus 2 n pi and 7 fourths pi plus 2 n pi, where n is any integer, positive or negative integer. That will give you all the solutions. That's your general solution. Infinite number of them. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Move on, or do you need to write any more? Sorry, the last one. I get my hands way away from the screen, so it won't That's okay. do anything. Okay, I'm, I think I'm good. Got it? Okay. So we will move to the next. Okay, what they're doing is skip. Oh, by the way, after every example, they have a checkpoint. And those checkpoints, you can go to audio, video, solution. Uh, find the audio video solution at larsonprecalculus.com. So go there. Okay. So let's back up because this is moving on to two pages away. So let's back up and do example two. Okay. Solve this one. Three times the tangent squared x minus 1 is equal to 0. Oh, my word. Okay, 3 tangent squared x minus 1 is equal to 0. Uh-oh, what are we going to have to do with this one? Now, remember my little hint before. If the if you had a single trig function, which we do, just tan x, before we had just sine x, that was fine. A single one. Uh, if it was to the first power, then we isolate the, the trig function on one side, get all the numbers to the other side. Okay. Now, this is a squared here, but it's still just a single trig function squared. There are no other things. You can't factor this. You can't do anything else with it. So again, do the same thing we did before. Let's isolate the square of it, and then we're going to have to wind up taking square roots. So let's first isolate tangent squared. And what would that be? What would be your first step there? Are you there? Help me. I assume your mic's not working, so I'll do it, go on and do it. Add one to both sides. My pen's not working, so maybe it's a... Um, it's working a little bit, but not completely. Add one to both sides. This adds to zero, so you get 3 times the tangent squared x is equal to 1. Okay, we can live with that. All right. We still want to isolate tangent squared. So what will we do next? Are you there? Okay. Oh, sorry, my internet connection. I'm sorry. It was solved Fritzy. <laughs> okay, what's next? Can you see what I've done? We isolated, or trying to isolate the tangent squared. So we divide both sides by 3. Exactly. Okay. Now, that gets rid of those. Now we have that tangent squared x is equal to one-third. We don't really care what tangent squared x is. We want to know what tangent x is. So what would you do? It must have broken again. Um, oh, there, there you are. Sorry, I was thinking. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Permitted. How do you undo a square? Oh, uh, square root. Yeah, take a square root of both sides. Square root of tangent squared would be tangent x, and square root of 1 is 1, and square root of 3 is the square root of 3. Now, some people don't like having a root 3 in the denominator, a square root in the denominator. If you don't, you could write this as 
the square root of 3, multiply both numerator and denominator the square root of 3. Because what square root of 3 over square root of 3? Any number over itself is? No, it's a 1, right? So if you multiply those, you get root 3 in the numerator. And root 3 times root 3 is just 3 in the denominator. So if you like that form better, that's fine. I don't care which form you have, but there is it. Now, do you happen to know what angle has a tangent of either 1 over root 3 or root 3 over 3? Those are the same numbers. They just express, excuse me, different ways. Do you happen to know that one? Okay. Let's go back to our unit circle again. Okay, I don't draw circles very well, and the pen is not cooperating at all well. There we go. Okay, and I'll try to get these. That's not very good either, but I'm not going to do it again. All right, remember those angles at pi 6? And this is the sine now. The sine of pi 6 is 1 half. Sine of pi root 2 over 2 is pi fourths. I'm sorry, I said it backwards. Sine of pi fourths Okay. And let me start that one over again. This is pi fourths, okay? And the sine of pi fourths is root two over two. Sines of pi thirds which is your 60 degrees, is root 3 over 3. Okay. Root 3 over 2, I mean. Sorry. Yeah! Sorry. It's a lot chillier today, and it's giving me the sneezes. Sorry. Okay. But you're awake now, I bet, huh? Okay. Well, maybe not. Okay. Um, now, why did I do all that? Well, remember that if you go backwards, they go in opposite directions. I mean, so the cosine of pi halves is 1. The cosine of pi thirds is 1 half. That's what we need to know. We need to know something that puts a root 3 in the numerator. Okay? Like we have right there. Root 3 over 2. And that would be sine of pi thirds. Because the tangent of pi thirds is equal to the sine of pi thirds over the cosine of pi thirds. Right? The, our ratio identities, the quotient identities, however you want to call that, tangent theta is sine theta over cosine theta. That's one you should know, okay? And if sine root 3, see, so what I wanted is a root 3 in a, denominator, in a numerator, okay? That's what I wanted. <clears throat> and here we have, um, that would be, uh, the square root of 3 over 2, and this would be 1 over 2. And when you multiply numerator and denominator by 2, you get rid of that. That gives you square root of 3 over 1. Okay, that's exactly the reciprocal of what we've got here. So that would be the cotangent of x would be that. So that means what we wanted was the root 3 in the denominator. So what we wanted is the sine, sorry, I said it backwards, sine of root, I'm sorry, I said root and said root pi. Sine of pi 6 is 1 half. Cosine of pi 6, remember you do those in the opposite direction, that would be root 3 over 2. And when you divide those, you get tangent of pi 6. Okay, so in other words, Forget I ever said these. Okay, I was doing it backwards there. 
I was seeing the numerator there of the root 3 and it, I needed this one, the, the denominator. So you want the sign in the denominator. Yeah, you want the root 3 in the denominator and sine over cosine. The cosine of pi 6 is root 3. Multiply numerator and denominator by 2 and this gives you 1 over root 3. Yuck! Okay. The pen is doing weird things. And that's exactly what we had here. That's why I sort of like this form better. So your answer here is x is equal to pi 6. My pen's not doing well. All right. But, again, the tangent... Remember, tangent period is different from sine and cosine. Because just like we did before, all students take calculus, okay, or chemistry, or all state technical college, however you want to remember that. Tangent is positive in the first and the third quadrant, which means its period is pi. Whatever you get here, you get down here. So its period is pi. So all you need is one of these here, pi 6 plus n pi. Okay. Now, if you did the one over here, like we did before, the other place where it's positive, that is just n pi plus pi 6. Okay. So it's just 1 pi plus pi 6. So this takes care of all of them. You don't need two in this case. Okay? Well, let's see. They indicate you do. Let me think for a moment here. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. When we take the square root, I'm sorry, I forgot about this, we're supposed to do plus or minus. Okay? Anytime you take the square root of a number, you need the plus or minus there. The minus would then be this one, 5, 6, pi, plus n pi. Okay? So the, this is 5 pi over 6 plus n pi. Because you see, it's here or here in the second and third quadrants. That takes care of the minus. Okay. Uh, and that's true. A minus would work for you here because you're squaring that tangent. So either a plus or a minus would do, so you do need them both. So you need the pi 6 plus n pi and the 5 6 pi plus n pi. You do need both of those. Okay. I'm sorry, I forgot about plus or minus square roots. All right, that was example two. And I don't know if you're still there or not. I see you're yeah, I'm still here. You're still. Did that make sense? Sorry, I forgot about the plus or minus there. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense. Okay, so let's move on to example three. And example three is also not on the PowerPoint. They didn't draw, draw a graph of this one, but I think that one will suffice. Uh, let's do example three. Now, you have to help me keep up with time. I went over time in my last class. Uh, no one told me, so I got lost there. But, uh, yeah, it's 11.05 now. Yeah, so we got another 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Here's example three. Cotangent. My pen is not writing. Okay, cotangent x times cosine squared of x is equal to 2 cotangent x. That's our equation. Now, do you see anything problematic with this one?
one thing, I don't know if your mic went out or internet went out or not, but one thing is you've got two different trig functions. So it's just like if you had a, uh, an equation that said x times y is equal to 2y, that's going to be hard to solve because you've got two different e variables there. Uh, or x times y squared is equal to 2x. That's That would be a very difficult... You can't solve it, okay? Unless you can figure out some relationship between the cotangents and cosines. And here is the place that, if you remember when we were doing our identities in the earlier sections, I said, if you can't see anything else to do, get everything in terms of sines and cosines. So what is cotangent in terms of sine and cosine? Now, actually, there is an easier way. Yeah, in fact, let's do the easier way. Sorry. Let's do like before, get everything on one side. So that means let's subtract 2 cotangent x from both sides. Now, that's not part of that term. Okay. And what happens then, you have a minus 2, in fact, I'm going to, yeah, I'll write it this way. Minus 2 cotangent x plus cotangent x cosine squared x, and my pen's not writing well, okay, is equal to 0, because this side goes to 0. Now, Notice what you can do to the left-hand side. What's the F word? Factor. Factor out a cos cotangent x. Least common factor in both terms is cotangent. So cotangent x. And I would be real tempted to factor out my minus sign as well. Okay, and that leaves me now. I'll think twice about that. Let's let's just factor out cotangent. I'm going to try to do it the same way the book does. Um, yeah, and that leaves me a minus two plus cosine squared x is equal to 0. Okay? Now, that is as completely as you factor. You might try to factor that cosine squared and the minus cosine x minus 2, but that's sort of difficult. Let's, let's just deal with the way we've got it. Two factors here. Multiplied to be 0, that means one or the other has to be 0. So either cotangent x is equal to 0, or, and I'm going to rearrange the order here, cosine squared x minus 2 is equal to 0. Okay, now, do you remember what cotangent is in terms of sines and cosines? Are you still there? Okay, I'm taking your internet. Must be sketchy again. So yeah, this. You got a little fuzzy there. Okay. So cotangent is what in terms of sines and cosines? Uh, cotangent is sine over cosine. So cotangent is cosine x over sine x. That's got to be 0. Well, the only way that can be 0 if it's cosine is 0. And where is the cosine equal to 0? Okay. I don't know if you remember your cosine graph very well. Can't get my pen to write. There, it wrote twice now. Okay. Cosine starts at 1 and goes down to 0 at pi halves. Then goes down to minus 1 at pi. And then back up to 
zero at three halves pi. So I don't know if you remember this, but cosine is zero at all of your half pi's. Okay, negative pi and half pi, three halves pi, five halves pi, negative three, all those. Okay, so how you express that, this x is equal to, my pen was right, there it goes, pi halves plus n pi, because there's exactly one pi between every one of these zeros. Exactly pi in between each one of those. So that would be pi halves plus n pi. The book may not write it that way, but that's the, I think, the best way to write it. Okay? So that takes care of that one. Let's do this one. What we need to do here is add 2 to both sides of the equation. Right? And that says cosine squared x is equal to 2. Right? Right. Okay. And how do you undo a square? You do the square root. Okay. So cosine x that would be square root of squared would be that is equal to plus or minus, don't forget that this time, root 2. Now, just give me a, a thumbnail sketch of about what root 2 is. Do you remember? Um, about 1.414. It's pretty easy to remember once you get used to it. About 1.414. So where is the cosine? Either positive 1.414 or a negative 1.414. Guess what? I just drew the cosine function for you, didn't I? And guess what? It only goes up to plus 1 and down to minus 1. Is it ever 1.414 or negative 1.414? doesn't happen. This is greater than or greater or less than uh, greater than 1 or less than minus 1. So this is outside the range. There is no value, no value at all of x that would ever give you a cosine that's greater than 1 or less than minus 1. doesn't happen. So therefore that side gives you absolutely nothing. Uh, no solution exists for cosines x equal plus or minus root 2 because that's outside the domain. So your answer and your only answer, and this is exactly how the book gives it, is that. Okay? Okay. Good deal. Um, it's 11.15. I, I was afraid that was the case. There is a checkpoint at the end of every problem, so please do those on and see, compare it to the audio video solution of at uh, cal, uh, calculus.com. We'll start next time with top of page 365, which is equations of the quadratic type, which we just were doing some. Uh, homework exercises here would include any of the odds 5 through 9. They're all at calcchat.com. And... I would say 11, 13, 11 and 13, uh, they're both at Calc Chat and 13's at Calc View. The reason I didn't go any further, those get into quadratics and we didn't quite get to those, so wanted to hold off on those for a moment. Okay? Any questions? All right, we, did, so. we didn't get too far today, I'm sorry about that, but... I don't feel as bad about it because there's so few, just you here. I don't know where the rest of them are. I don't want to get so far ahead of them. I can't catch up, but we've got to keep moving. Uh, and then there was a lot of discussion at the very beginning. Well, I was late of the uh, my other class. And by the way, nobody else signed in, did they? I didn't see no, any no, other names pop up. Anybody. Okay. All right. So, Thomas, I hope to see you on Thursday, and I hope you bring some friends, okay? Okay. All right. I hope some of the others will show up, too. So we'll see you. I've got another class starting at 1030, so I've got to, to book it. All right. I mean, 1130. Well, you don't have what? people stopping here in the halls this time. 
Yeah, well, that's true too. Okay. All right. We'll see you then on Thursday. All right. See you All on right. Thursday.